In this video, I'll talk about how I put the thing online. I got a few users to try it out. I used 100 million Anthropic tokens in the process because I didn't lock down my API key and uh, spend a bit of money. And we'll also go into how I had to rename the plugin because of Obsidian's guidelines, what's the current status of it, how you can go and try this thing out yourself, and what the next steps look like. So with all that said, let's jump right in. So where are we at with the plugin and what are next steps? Well, the current status is everything works. And the next steps though are to really get this some degree of polish to publish out to the world and get it out there into people's hands and see how they use it. This is essentially a beta test, but as part of it, we also wanna get this in the store. That's how people are really gonna use it. It is a poor user experience to have to go to GitHub and download this thing and install it manually. That's pretty bad. So anyone could come over here to GitHub and go find the latest release, but that is a pain. That is something developers do. And uh, well, a ton of us Obsidian users are developers to be sure. We want this to be able to be usable by everyone. That is part of the point, part of the fun of all this vibe coding we've been doing. So as you can see here, uh, there's a renaming going on. And that's on my list here is to, I need to rename everything, including the repo, which I've done here. And then finalize the integration with light LM, which I will talk about in a moment. But the rename, a quick background on why would you rename your project from Obsidian Meta Plugin, very, very brutalist, very direct. Uh, the reason is that <laughs> Obsidian has rules. So Obsidian has rules when you go and add a plugin to their store. And here I was, Obsidian, <laughs> I was proposing the Obsidian Meta Plugin as a plugin. And then their automated system came back and it said, hey, don't use Obsidian in the name. Don't use plugin in the name. So that would, uh, that would have just left me with Meta as the name of this plugin, which is not great. So we're just gonna embrace the vibe coding. We're going to be Vibesidian going forward. And that's gonna be that. I even went into the AI I even went into the AI and had it create a logo for us. How nice. I actually did this for the original version, OMP, Obsidian Meta Plugin, blah, blah. I experimented with just calling it Vibe as well, but Vibe Obsidian it is. So we have a logo that is in the readme and so things are looking good. Aside from uh, what needs to be done. So I need to resubmit this from my new GitHub repository because this will redirect, but I suspect that's gonna cause issues with their system. It might cause issues with review. We don't wanna go through that. So if I click here, it should go to the Vibe City. There we go. That's nice. Uh, I'm not gonna change the video, the demo video. I'm just gonna leave that be, even though it's called Obsidian Meta Plugin. We can re-record it later if we want. And going back to our Obsidian Vault with the Vibe City, the Vibe Plugin over here, Vibe Chat. This all works, it does what it's supposed to do. And uh, so I also need to finalize the integration with light LM. So let's briefly touch on what that is. Well, to get there, we first need to touch on what, well, what was I planning here? So I, I even have the rename to Obsidian. This is uh, in progress actually. And the light LM integration, which is actually also in progress. I need to keep up with these. So basically the gist of it is that I want anyone to be able to use this out of the box, at least during the beta period. So you just install the plugin and you can use it, which is generally what I would expect from an Obsidian plugin. And the kicker or the difficulty there is that this plugin needs to talk to an AI. And so where, where's that gonna come from? <laughs> where's the AI gonna come from? Well, uh, in development, the idea was that you just provide an API key and a base URL but that is going to limit the amount of users that will actually try it out. I want people to try it and see where it fails, where it's useful, if at all. And so I made the move to provide free access to GPT 4.1 and Claude Sonnet. Claude Sonnet mainly because that's what I've been using in development and I know this works pretty well. GPT 4.1 because it is just sort of the other side of the aisle, the OpenAI, uh, 
latest and greatest that is not a thinking model, which Claude Sonnet is both thinking and non-thinking, depending on what mode you want to use it in. But for development here, I was really just going for the non-thinking version because it's faster. Admittedly, the thinking is probably going to do a better job, but that's something to explore later. For now, we just want to get this out into everyone's hands and see how people break it. And they have been breaking it, it seems, because my initial thought was to go provide AI access by my own API and let people use it. And I did. And what was the result of that? Well, we can uh, go and look. <laughs> and the result of that is <laughs> about 80 bucks spent on my API key. And that was slightly unexpected. Well, as you can imagine, I didn't intend to spend $80 on a side project, but it was slightly unexpected in that I have, where is it? I have in here rate limits set up. As you can see here, really rate limits, 80 requests over five minutes. The thing is, uh, and this is pretty straightforward, I just hadn't thought it through. The request per minute or any number of requests per time is pretty unimportant in the land of large language models. The reason is that requests are extremely expensive compared to what we're used to in web development, which is requests cost nothing. Like there's a, there's a performance hit to do a network round trip, but we don't think of it as costing any sort of monetary amount. But when you're hitting a large language model, there is very much a, a monetary cost associated with each request, at least each successful request. So that is the situation. Uh, we have spent a bit of money and all of this led me to the conclusion that I need to limit usage based on the actual user. So I went and looked at a number of solutions here. There is uh, Helicone, Cloudflare, AI Gateway, which is what I've been using here. And there's Light LLM. So there are all these things. And uh, I first came across Cloudflare AI Gateway because I use Cloudflare and I, was, I, I like using Cloudflare workers. So I thought this made sense. But uh, it turns out there are some limitations. So I also looked into Helicone, which is a SaaS company that provides observability, which is essentially what we have here. Like there's an error. Hey, what's the error about? We have logs for each and every request. We have costs, etc. Helicone does that as well. The thing that they do not do, as far as I can tell, is let you wrap up your API key and expose a bunch of models, which is exactly what Light LLM does. So ultimately, Light LLM looks like the perfect solution. The only downside is that this thing is self-hosted. And uh, whenever I can avoid it, I will avoid it. <laughs> I will avoid hosting stuff on my own servers because ultimately it's up to me to maintain them and things get out of date. Uh, you know, with, when it comes to side projects, it's easy to forget that something is running on your server. You can, of course, just do a Docker PS, but take my word for it if, uh, if you haven't had this experience yet. When you're working with side projects, so there's no not necessarily any monetary value attached to it, it's very easy to just forget that you have this thing running on the server, say three years down the line. And so you might shut down the server to stop paying for it because you don't know what you're using it for. And then your service goes down. And that is unfortunate for anyone who might still be using it. Point being, I try to avoid hosting my own stuff when possible. But in this case, the very best solution was clearly late LM. So that's what we went with. And I even made a diagram of the whole situation here. Let's go and look at uh, V1. We can close that out too. V1 over here is basically development. During the development phase, it was just me in Obsidian with my Anthropic API key hitting Anthropic directly. That worked great, but so what about when we ship this to users? Well, the simple solution is bring your own key. You bring your own Anthropic API key or OpenAI or whatever, because I did build it to be agnostic. And so you, the user, bring that key, you, you put it into the UI, which is exactly what, what we've seen in some of the videos here. If I can, uh, if I can open the settings, which exact, is exactly what this field is right here. And then you hit the AI and you get results. So this is still ultimately the, <clears throat> where this plugin is headed because uh, unless I somehow monetize this, and there are no plans to monetize this in any way, unless I was to monetize it and actually make money from it, uh, I'm not just going to be paying for people's attempts to customize Obsidian forever. But during the beta period, I do want to provide a better user experience, and I want to get feedback to see how useful we can make this thing. So now here's production V2, 
which is, hey, let's use Cloudflare Workers, let's use API Gateway, which I found, which is basically observability and logging. And they have a rate limiter, but it is pretty lackluster, unfortunately. So uh, if anyone at Cloudflare ever sees this, uh, <laughs> let's talk about how to make this thing better. Or rather, just build what LightLM has, but build it into your AI gateway. <clears throat> So the idea here is that you have no API key and that's exactly what we want. You just hit my endpoint and within that endpoint, within the environment, we store the API key. That goes in through AI Gateway, which handles rate limiting, uh, again, in a very limited way. And then that goes to Anthropic and you get the response. So this works and this is exactly how I have managed to rack up the sum that we have here of 70 bucks, 80 bucks using exactly this architecture. And so the next step was to use LightLM. And this is actually better for a number of reasons, uh, not least of which is that we can control cost per user, but we can also expose everything via one endpoint. So Anthropic, you can expose as an open AI endpoint, which is quite nice. But also there's a one less step. So here's what we were doing. You'll notice there are a ton of network hops here, just an obscene number of network hops for what we're doing here. There is user or browser to the worker, and there is a worker to gateway, and there is gateway to Anthropic. So that is three, where essentially you could accomplish this with one, as we were doing here and here. So in this, in this version, even though it looks more complicated, it's actually much better in this regard, because the browser, aka Obsidian, will go and ask for a key from LightLM, and it's going to do this via the worker, which we can cover why that's necessary but it goes and asks for a key for the user. And then using that key, it's gonna hit LightLM directly, which is gonna hit Anthropic. So we have two network hops here instead of three, which is better. So this is, this is quite, quite nice. And the reason that this is faster, that there are only two network hops is that this hop to authenticate, there are these two hops, but these two hops happen once, at least in theory, they happen when you install the plugin, and then you're done. You don't have to repeat it. It goes and grabs the API key, sends it back to the browser, and it's stored, and then you can use that against LightLM. So the idea here is that we create a key for each user. And so that's why the worker comes in here, because we actually need to create a key in our system here. We need some sort of privilege. We need admin privileges, or at least the privileges to write user API keys. And so that's exactly what, what we did. Here we have we have the light LM admin key. So using this, we can go create a key, and then we can hand that back to the browser. That is exactly what we do. And if you are curious about the code, what that looks like, it looks like this. If the target path is key generate, then we're going to go do this thing, which is going to pass that on to where I'm hosting light LM. So this is a light LM instance. Hit key generate, and we gotta use our authenticated key. So this is essentially an admin key that is stored in the environment of the Cloudflare worker. So using that, we go, we make the post request. We in the back end, we have a team, uh, quote unquote team, within Light LM, and this team has a budget associated with it. So all these beta testers are in this beta testers team, uh, and this is the ID for beta testers. So assign them to a team, and I also set a budget for this key itself, which is eight bucks every seven days which also may seem like a ton, uh, and it is, but it, if people start hitting this a lot, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna drop it down. The, the idea here is, again, that I wanna collect feedback. So if people are using this significantly, then I don't want, say, just one plugin flow to use up all the credits, which it might, it's quite possible. $8 is not a huge amount when using Cloud Sonnet, but it's enough to start. So that's where we're gonna start. And uh, even by the time I make this video, I may have updated this. So that, that may no longer be relevant. Point being that what we are doing here is pretty simple. Just go create a key this way and hand that key back. So just return the entire body of that re request and uh, add course, because we're gonna be using this from the browser. So that's that. Let me go back here. That is the whole architecture. That was this step here. That was the Cloudflare workers code, which hits LightLM, which is hosted. And we can go look at that real quick, somewhere, 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 somewhere. So here we have 
the all the keys all the virtual keys are right here and so you can see some of these i created just for myself like the the team admins that personal use key the test key was one i was just using uh, to see if the api worked and then we have all these beta test users which are actually all test users for now because they have not switched over from cloudflare api gateway yet but the uh, the core thing here is that you can see usage and you can see it per user so you can also see it per team you can see that the admins i myself with my own api keys have spent about five bucks 30 cents so far since setting this up and the beta testers uh, which is also just me have spent six cents but once this goes live the point is that i'm going to be able to see who's using what and it's going to be really limited and that is exactly what we want so that people don't burn through so that mainly so that one user doesn't burn through a ton of credits sort of like i want everyone to get a little bit uh of a chance to use this and obviously anyone can use this if you just bring your own api key and there, there are no limits or the only limits that are imposed on you are whatever OpenAI, anthropic whatever your provider is imposing on you so if you're using olama it costs you nothing other than electricity but so this is just for the users that don't have an api key or don't want to set one up etc and i'll be able to track my usage here and of course i can go into the API keys, and I can shut any one of them down if I need to do for whatever reason. But this is the gist. This light LM, and we're all set up, and things are good. So the rename is almost complete. We just need to push everything up and make sure everything works. The integration with light LM is complete too. I just need to test it, and namely, I need to test the 429 as in the rate limiting. I need to create a new key and give it some sort of extremely low limit, like one cent, and then use it and let it hit that limit. And then make sure that the UI responds appropriately, that it actually gives an error message saying, hey, you're limited, instead of just doing nothing, which is the previous former functionality, and get this in the Obsidian store. Once it's there, we can call this sort of a off and away. It's, it's in the hands of users, and we'll get feedback. And things will go well, or they won't, we'll see. But at that point, my job here is at least temporarily done until we get feedback from others. There are also a few other things that I didn't fully touch on in this video. It's now been a week or two since I did most of that recording. And there are a few things like giving the generated code the ability to talk to the AI through the Vibesidian plugin so that any plugins that it creates for you can go talk to the AI, which can be pretty useful if you want to use AI features. Making sure that there are reasonable error messages if you're using the free tier, we can call it, that I provide and run out of tokens, run out of quota, then the app should tell you. So that's done. And I actually got feedback on the plugin that I submitted to put it into the Obsidian community store. And the feedback was that there are a number of things that I need to change about the plugin, uh, which is fine. There was some automated feedback that I resolved. And now there's more in-depth automated feedback that I need to resolve. Although part of this has already been done already just was not present when I made the initial pull request. And so if you want to see the status of this, whenever you watch, you can go to this URL in the Obsidian repo and you can see what happened. And once this gets merged, you'll be able to access it within Obsidian, which is of course exactly what we want. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. And so by the time you see this, maybe it will be launched on the Obsidian store. You can go look for it there. Uh, if not, you can go install it from GitHub, which is definitely a bit more work, but well, it's the only other way. All right, that's all for now. See ya.